Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, now let's begin with John Keats's poem, Ode on a Grecian Urn. First, we'll have an introduction to the poet, his concept negative capability, his interest in Elgin marbles, which actually inspired him to write many poems, including this Ode on a Grecian Urn. Before that, we'll read on seeing the Elgin marbles, a sonnet. Then we will analyze the poem linguistically and rhetorically. Thereafter, we will offer two readings, an intrinsic reading and an extrinsic reading. First, let us look into the historical and literary context. There was a reaction against the neoclassical style and outlook in the early 19th century. There was open revolution of people and against oppression. Some silent revolution among poets against traditional tastes also was seen. Some of the poets like Clare, Keats and Shelley had short lived lives. From this period, particularly from Keats, we understand the concept of negative capability which is a state of mind which accepts uncertainties. Keats also gave this concept along with Wordsworth and Coleridge, this concept of organic unity of poems. There was a serious examination of self, nature and imagination among various poets. We have two groups of poets, senior romantic poets like Robert Southey, William Wordsworth, Samuel Taylor Coleridge and junior generation of romantic poets like Keats, Shelley and Lord Byron. John Keats was born in 1795 and died in 1821 and in his lifetime he had to go through various difficulties as he lost his father at the age of 8 and mother at the age of 14. He was the eldest child of the family with three siblings and that means with some responsibility. He also had a serious problem of tuberculosis with which he struggled but failed and that is why he died very early. He was trained to become an apothecary surgeon that means he went into the medical field to become a doctor. But he abandoned medicine for the sake of poetry and his lady love. Fanny Braun. He lived with a deep awareness of mortality, but died as an immortal poet. In his own lifetime, when he published his poems, he was seriously negatively criticized by the reviewers of Edinburgh and Quarterly magazines. He was treated as a Cockney school poet, but he has left a corpus of poetry from a brief life of 25 years. Some of his well known words are Word on a Grecian urn, Ote a nightingale, To autumn and the rest. His poetic rodo can be understood from this line from his poem, A thing of beauty is joy forever. Beauty, truth, good, these were very important for poets like Keats. What are the words written by Keats for which he is well known? We have six famous words beginning from Ode on a Grecian urn, Ode to a nightingale, T autumn, Ode on melancholy, then Ode to psyche and at last Ode on indolence. All put together we have only 320 lines from these 6 words, but these 320 lines have kept the fame of 
John Keats alive to this day. We have any number of books on these words. Here we have one example of a book by Helen Wendler on the words of John Keats in that picture. What is this negative capability for which Keats is equally well known? In one of his letters to his brothers George and Tom dated 21st December 1817, he wrote this. At once it struck me what quality went to form a man of achievement, especially in literature and which Shakespeare possessed so enormously. I mean negative capability that is when a man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. Coleridge for instance would let go by a fine isolated verisimilitude caught from the penetralium of mystery, from being incapable of remaining content with half knowledge. This pursued through volumes would perhaps take us no further than this that with a great poet the sense of beauty overcomes every other consideration or rather obliterates all consideration. From this concept of negative capability, we understand Shakespeare is a great poet, Keats is a great poet, all other poets who can have this sense of being in uncertainties without irritable reaching after fact and reason, they are great poets. Therefore, for poets like Keats, beauty is the most important feature in life and art. His ode, Ode on a Grecian Urn, in fact deals with the theme of beauty. Keats was interested in Greek art and culture. He visited British Museum and saw these Elgin marbles. These were in fact brought to London by the Earl of Elgin who was an ambassador to Turkey. He brought the Parthenon marbles to England and later sold them to the British Museum in 1836. That is when Keats and his painter friend Benjamin Hayden visited the British Museum in 1837 and saw these marbles. On seeing these marbles, Keats wrote a sonnet on the same evening of March 2nd, 1817. He also later composed this ode on a Grecian urn. Here is a sonnet on seeing the Elgin marbles written in 1817 on seeing these marbles. My spirit is too weak, mortality weighs heavily on me like unwilling sleep and each imagined pinnacle and steep rocks and river banks of godlike hardship tells me I must die like a sick eagle looking at the sky, yet it is a gentle luxury to weep that I have not the cloudy winds to keep. Fresh for the opening of the morning's eye, such dim conceived glories of the brain bring round the heart an undescribable feud, so do these wonders a most dizzy pain that mingles Grecian grandeur with the rude wasting of old time with a below a main, a sun, a shadow of a magnitude. This magnitude, this grandeur Keats saw in Grecian art. Now let us understand a few background details about this poem Ode on a Grecian Urn. Keats wrote this poem in 1819 and published it in 1820. It has 15 lines and 5 stanzas. Each stanza has 10 lines. This poem is actually a tale. It is a history. It deals with the history of humankind and tells about love and death. This poem is a meditation on the eternal quality of art and the evanescent nature of love and happiness. This temporal love and happiness is captured eternally in art form on this urn which motivated 
kids to write this immortal poem. The essence of this poem is this, if beauty is truth, truth is beauty and that is what we have to know according to Keats. Let us begin with the first stanza. Thou still unravished bride of quietness, thou fast child of silence and slow time, sylvan historian who canst thus express a flowered tale more sweetly than our rhyme. What leaf fringe legend haunts about thy shape of deities or mortals or of both in Tempe of the Dales of Arcady? What men or gods are these? What maidens loath? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? What pipes and timbrels? What wild ecstasy? Stanza 2. Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore, you soft pipes play on not to the sensual ear, but more endeared pipe to the spirit ditties of no tone. Fair youth, beneath the trees thou canst not leave, thy song nor even can those trees be bare. Bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss, though winning near the goal yet do not grieve. She cannot fade, though thou hast not thy bliss, for ever will thou love and she be fair. Stanza 3. Ah, happy, happy boughs that cannot shed your leaves nor ever bid the spring add you, and happy melodist unwearied, forever piping songs, forever new. More happy love, more happy, happy love, forever warm and still be enjoyed, forever panting and forever young, all breathing human passion far above that leaves your hearts high, sorrowful, and cloyed your burning forehead and your parching tongue. Stanza 4. Who are these coming to the sacrifice? To what green altar, O mysterious priest, leadest thou that heifer lowing at the skies and all her silken flanks with garlands dressed? What little town by river or seashore or mountain belt with peaceful citadel is emptied of this folk, this pious morn, and little town thy steeds for evermore will silent be and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can ever return. Stands of 5. O attic shape, fair attitude with bread of marble men and maidens overwrought with forest branches and the trodden weed, thou silent form dost tease us out of thought as doth eternity, cold pastoral when old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain in midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man to whom thou sayest, beauty is truth, truth beauty, that is all you know on earth and all you need to know. This is the last stanza and the last two lines are immortal lines. They have been a source of inspiration for poets and people all alike. When we pay attention to the thematic contrast we have in this poem, we identify a pair of words like silence and speech which also can be sung in this uh, poem. Ecstasy and misery, spirit and body, fair and black or ugly, win and lose, grief and celebration, desolation and consolation, cold and warm, old and young, beauty, truth and ugliness and untruth. This silent form sings a song, it tells a history, that is why we have this silence and speech. Associated with this silence and speech, we have many pairs of contrasts like ecstasy and misery and from there we come to beauty and truth on the one hand and ugliness and untruth on the other hand. We can see a number of poetic devices in this poem starting from apostrophe to a number of images of the vase. The poem is a kind of address to the Grecian urn by the poet. There is a personification in the very first line, thou still unravished bride of quietness. This urn, lifeless urn is considered a bride by the poet. We have alliteration and assonance within the same line, thou fast child of silence and slow time, we have indicated this difference between alliteration and assonance by this underlining yes and then the color code i in red color. 
So, we can see both alliteration and assonance in line number 2. We have one of the most beautiful paradoxes that we have seen in poetry that is heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. We also have a transferred epithet in happy bows. We have personification of love in line number 25. Anaphora can be seen in line number 26 and 27, which starts with forever, forever. We have again alliteration in of marble men and maidens overwrought. Marble men and maidens, when we put them together like this, there is a beauty in the sound. We also have chiasmus in the last two lines, beauty is truth, truth beauty, that is all you know on earth and all you need to know, nothing else, nothing else to worry about. His whole life that is Keats's whole life was devoted to this beauty, probably the beauty of Fanny Braun, his own poetic art represented by this Grecian urn. We have some images of this vase in this poem. This vase can represent a pictorial art, it can be a painting, it can be a sculpture, it is a poetic model also a, and it deals with the theme of time and eternity. How to capture this evanescent passing time in art is the burden, the responsibility of poets, artists in general. We have wonderful rhyme, rhythm and meter in this poem. The rhyme scheme is A B A B C D E D C E. The rhythm and meter can be understood in one phrase iambic pentameter. This is a traditional poem and we have cesura, enjambment and end stopped lines. In the example we have, we can also understand the rhyme and all that. Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore, you soft pipes play on not to the sensual ear, but more endeared, pipe to the spirit ditties of no tone. We have of course, variations in rhythm as we can see spondy in heard me, soft pipes. We also have trochee in play on, not to pipe to. We have pyrrhic in melodies, second part of melodies and second part of ditties. To give an overall impression of this poem, we have these points to look at. The Grecian urn is very impressive for the poet, that is why we have this poem. Impressed by the silent Grecian urn, Keats urges the urn to tell her tale more impressively than a poem could do in rhymes. But what Keats does is to write one of the greatest odes in English. Keats attempts to interpret what the urn could mean and allows it to be a state of mystery and achieves the quality of negative capability that he admires in Shakespeare. Whatever he admired in Shakespeare, he could exemplify that in his own poem. He privileges silent and passive scene as a source of eternal love and happiness. Whatever picture he could see on the vase, he writes about the fair youth and the procession that is a symbol of love. He finds the deserted town portrayed on urn as desolate because nobody is there. Everybody has left the town to attend the procession. Keats considers his own youthful age wasted in comparison with the teasing urn which speaks a nugget of wisdom on beauty as truth. The urn is an inspiration for the poet to achieve something remarkable in his short time. That is why he has written this poem. We said we have two readings, one intrinsic, another ex extrinsic. Let us see these two first. Let us start with an intrinsic reading offered by Clamp Brooks. T. S. Eliot and Middleton Murray, in fact, found fault with this poem because they did not believe that this statement beauty is truth and truth beauty could stand the test of scrutiny. The statement ripeness is all from a character like Edgar in King Lear is acceptable artistically because this is in near drama, but in the case of poem who speaks is it a dramatic character is not very clear to us. That is why Eliot and Middleton Murray did not accept it. 
Similarly, Brooks transforms the urn into a dramatic character to accommodate the speech at the end artistically and thus disentangle it from the problem of belief and scientific truth. If the poet presents it as a belief and as a scientific truth, how do we believe it? That is a problem. So, if it is presented as a speech from the character in a poem or in a drama, then the problem between belief and scientific truth can be tackled very easily. That is what Brooks has done. Therefore, Brooks achieves his critical aim by positing the idea of history without footnotes as a Sylvan historian in the ode tells the tale or the history of the depopulated town. It meant Brooks uses images and ideas from within the poem and not from outside the text. That is how Brooks practices this intrinsic criticism. These two sentences beauty is truth truth beauty that is all you need to know. Brooks is able to support this uh, uh, statement by making this poem into a drama as if somebody speaks from the poem itself not from outside. Now, we have an opposite reading that is extrinsic reading. How to support this view from facts outside the poem? Kenneth Burke offered a dramatistic reading of the ode in 1943 to appreciate Keats reconciliation of the opposition between practical and poetic ideals in the poem by a close study of the images. Kenneth Burke used extrinsic details from the life of the poet including Keats tuberculosis, his love for Fanny and his interest in the Elgin marbles. He developed the critical triad of drama, prayer and chart to examine the unconscious, rhetorical and historical aspects of the poem respectively. Language is symbolic according to Kenneth Burke and so the poem is a symbolic act, but it privileges the poem which originates in the non-symbolic urn. Poem is separate from the urn which Keats saw in the British Museum. Bridgers, a critic, argues that Brooks consigned Burke to ashes by a footnote to Burke's essay in his essay on the word, thereby resurrecting Burke today. Actually, Burke's essay appeared earlier, Brooks wrote later on, but then Brooks referred to this uh, Burke's essay in a footnote. That is why this idea of history without footnotes is uh, here and this footnote by Brooks today has resurrected Burke's reading. In summary, we have seen the historical and literary context of Keats which enabled him to come up with his poems and also poetic concepts like negative capability. Keats had a serious interest in Greek art and culture which we understand through his visiting the British Museum, seeing Elgin marbles, writing a sonnet on this Elgin marbles in on seeing the Elgin marbles plus his ode, ode on a Grecian urn. We analyze the poem linguistically and rhetorically, offered our in impression and then we went on to discuss this poem with reference to two critical essays, one by Clement Brooks, another by Kenneth Burke. Actually, these two readings are two different approaches to the poem. One critic Brooks uses the images within the poem without reference to other facts from outside the poem, whereas Kenneth Burke uses some external factors to read this poem. From internal or external sources, whatever way we approach the poem, the poem is considered to be one of the greatest poems in English. Let us see some references now. Thank you.